there came that day where I had to kind of, as a baby bird would jump from the nest, like just give my, my notice at work. And, and that's really when the business took off. It was like, you know, do or die. And it was it's one of the, you know, kind of scariest things I've ever done. But, I, you know, it's you got to take those risks to really succeed. Welcome to the third story. I'm your host, Leo Sidrin. You've got a great beat and I can dance to you. And that was drum loop guru Ryan Groose on the basics of ornithology. You hear that? That chunky monkey playing behind me? That, my friends, is one of the greatest drummers around. Mark Juliana. Dig the sound of his drums. Check out the syncopated dirtiness. That is modern. It's so beautiful. Mark played on David Bowie's already legendary last album, Black Star. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, check this out. Mmm. Ah. Uh. You know what that is? Eric Harland. Eric Harland. There is something so crunchy about this groove. He's got those trashy cymbals. He's got that high-tuned snare drum. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Check, check this out. Matt Chamberlain, one of the workingest guys around. He played with everybody. His sound is the sound of recorded drums for the last 20 years. How you like them, Fiona Apples? This is turning into drum porn, I know. Okay. Well, why am I playing all this for you? Because all of these grooves are part of the Loop Loft drum sample library that Ryan Grew started. I love this stuff, and I use it all the time in my own productions. And since the company was launched, I've been following the trajectory. Although it's a production library, it behaves as much like a record label as anything else. The content is clearly curated by a huge music fan, and that's Ryan. What's it all being created for? For producers and musicians to use in their own recording. Can't afford to hire Matt Chamberlain, don't live on a coast, wish you could jam with Omar Hakim. This stuff allows people to essentially collaborate on a limited basis with the greats. It's not the first time it's been done. Since the advent of samplers, all kinds of people, known and unknown, have created content for production. But there's something about the way this series is curated that intrigues me. As I was putting together my wish list for Third Story podcast interviews, Ryan was developing his list for Loop Loft library content, and I noticed that we often overlapped. For example, when he ventured out of the typical drum and percussion realm and into melodic instruments, he made libraries with both Charlie Hunter and Doug Womble, both of whom I also talked to for the third story. So it was clear to me that Ryan and I had similar taste, and ultimately I felt like he was making stuff almost specifically for me. At the core of it, you can tell that somebody behind all of this cares. Ryan said he wanted to be the blue note of drum loops, and I know what he means. As it turns out, the path that Ryan took to get there was unexpected, and it was an incredible confluence of events and experiences that led him there. He also totally schooled me in online marketing and the basics of business development and drip campaigns, and I picked up a few tricks. For example, there are some really shocking and incredible moments in this conversation that will have you wondering, did that just happen? Did they just say that? Listen on and hear it for yourself. So, Ryan Gruss, we have met before. We have. But it's been a hot minute. Like 10 years. I knew you as the drummer from The Rinse and didn't know much else about you. The next thing I heard was that you had left New York, moved to Boston, got a day job, mm -hmm. and stop me if you've heard this before, and set up a kind of a recording rig in your basement or something and started making loops. Yeah, so, you know, I was in the rinse in, you know, when, when was that, 2005, 2006, we were doing the whole trying to get signed thing and, you know, be so close to a deal and some A&R guy like, would get fired or we just, it was one of those things. And after having worked in the music industry and on at Atlantic Records um, before that, um, and then doing the thing with the rinse, got married and I was like, let's just kind of put this music thing aside. And I had kind of built this career around a day job of digital asset management, which sounds really boring and it actually is pretty boring, like day to day, but it's the management of, of files, kind of pre-Dropbox. So I, I was doing that. Actually, during the rinse, I worked at Nickelodeon, organizing their digital files so licensees could pay for them and download them. And that's, I kind of helped, you know, build the, these software systems and, and geeky IT stuff that led to this um, kind of a great opportunity in Boston. And, you know, finally a salary where I could afford to buy a house. And, you know, coming from New York, that's a, a luxury in itself to, like, 
have a room to like set up your drums. But I was kind of stepping away from music too, so I wasn't really like, oh, I'm gonna start a band and like we're gonna get signed and, and do this whole thing. It was more just, you know, just casual practicing on you know on the weekends and getting acquainted with Logic and multi-track recording on my own. And that's kind of where the loop left started to, to begin. I remember when our mutual friend Will Bates said to me, Oh, Ryan's got this thing where every day he posts another loop and you can just download it and use exactly. it. Exactly. The concept was I, I you know, I, I felt kind of musically isolated and, and lonely. I'm I'm in Boston, I'm in this house out in the suburbs. Um, and I it was the first time like in my professional or music kind of career, um, or whatever you want to call it, hadn't been in a band and playing with people constantly. So the one way I, I figured I could kind of still create music with people was to start you know, recording drum loops. And I started this blog. It's still there, uh, ryangroose.com. And my goal was to every day create a loop. And it was actually a full multi-track logic session that you could open up um, and just a WordPress blog. And, and I'd kind of write a story or, or a blog post about why I recorded this beat and what inspired it and just a lot of dumb, silly stuff. And uh, after a few months of that, it Create Digital Music, which is like a pretty massive music tech blog, picked up on the story and I was like flooded with traffic and requests for more of these live drum loops. And apparently like there was a hole in the market for this, like really good quality live drums that beyond what comes, you know, with, with garage band or logic or your typical built in loop pack with software. So that was kind of the motivation to keep, keep doing that. And, and the blog continued for a year or two. And I, I, added like a subscription element to it where you could kind of for ten dollars a month you could get like a hundred loops or something like that so that continued and and for, after two years i had all this content and i just wanted to organize it into like jazz loops and funk loops and kind of categorize them and that's in 2010 that was the start of the loop loft it's amazing to me it's been that long i found it pretty quickly i think i sent you an email when i discovered it looking for multi-track drums yeah i don't know exactly why I got so fixated on that, but there was one or two libraries of multi-track drums that I had seen before that sounds from the big room, I think was one or drums from the big room. Do you yeah. Know one? I think the Sony or somebody did it. I don't know. I just loved that. I could open up multi-track stuff and mix it myself and treat it like it felt more like making a record to me that yeah, way. You, you can, you can yeah, mix to your own taste and add your own effects and compression and eek, you know, do your thing, you know? And so I found it and I was shocked to realize that it was you. I just was unhappily surprised <laughs> to see it. And I used it like crazy. Awesome. And I realized I used your playing a, a lot, which, you know, I think actually is saying something because it was easier for me to have you play drums than it was for me to set up mics and play Yeah, you're a play great drummer drums. yourself, which was, well, I was kind of like, why are you yeah. using my stuff? But I guess... It just, you know, it just is a different process. But the next thing I started to see was the choices that you made when you expanded the Loop Loft into these artist packages. Yeah, that, so that was kind of the next phase. I I'd started the Loop Loft and it was just my stuff. Um, so if you go there now and you see a packet, it doesn't have anybody's name on it. It's, it's that's me playing drums. Um, but then I was like, well, you know, how do I take this one step further? I wanted to make kind of like a fantasy football for for music like having lived in new york for you know almost 10 years I, I was pretty connected pretty much one degree away from anybody that i would ideally have record for me um so of course the first people i started with were you know bob reynolds who's an amazing sax player um one of my best friends and old you know we were roommates at berkeley so he i believe he was the first first artist and then it was yannick Guzdala, another great bass player berkeley friend mm -hmm. um and then Cel he introduced me to celso alberti incredible Brazilian drummer out in San Francisco. And that was kind of where it started. And then, you know, I was like, okay, these are my friends. How do I get even further outside the circle of my friends and get the Matt Chamberlains of the world and the Omar Hakims? And yeah, I love that you say the fantasy league, because I think you say a lot about your own taste and about certain musical values that, I mean, I, it just became very clear to me, Eric Harlan, Matt Chamberlain, uh, Mark Juliana, Doug Womble, Charlie it's, Hunter. Yeah, it's my favorite. And a lot of these guys, I mean, some are my age, some are, you know, 10, 20 years older, and they were my musical heroes. Well, Omar Hakim, I know you've posted a lot about what an influence he had. Yeah, on like I just wore out like all the Dire Straits and Sting and Weather Report. Like he was, you know, a god. He's still a god. Like he's he's one of the, the best. And then like Matt Chamberlain, like in college, like that was, he was like my 
my idol, the yeah. stuff he was doing, you know, the session work, and it's just his his feel and his groove. And there's a certain DNA and and people's in these artists playing that sets them apart from. That's why they are the Matt Chamberlains and the Omar Hakims. And, right. Um, so if, my thought was, well, what if I could kind of bring that to the masses? Like most people can't afford to hire these guys or they're just so busy, they're touring, you know, doing their own session work. I was like, what if we kind of democratize the ability to to use these guys on, you know, thousands of tracks a day? And so that's kind of the impetus for for reaching out to them and and growing the roster that way. What has it been like for you as a fan and as a drummer to be in such close proximity working with these, particularly these other drummers? Every time I'm in a session, I'm like pinching myself. I'm like, here I am, you know, like with Omar Hakim in his home studio, which is, he has a really nice home studio out, out in New Jersey and uh, just collaborating with them. And, and, and that's the fun part is kind of getting ready for the sessions and uh, I'll try to capture 12 concepts each time we record so that could be 12 different tempos um and i'll 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 just print out a sheet of like kind of ideas like 90 bpm you know funk shuffle i'll think about stuff that he's recorded in the past and kind of what he's you know what people would want from him because that's really what they they kind of recognize in his playing and try to capture that and get all the elements that people need to make a song so He'll just, we'll let the tape roll, put the click on, and uh, play some verse grooves, play some chorusy kind of grooves, play a bunch of fills, play a bunch of stops. And then at the end of it, you know, once it's all chopped up, you pretty much have all the building blocks for creating a song with, yeah. you know, and multi track Omar Hakim drums. So 12 ideas. I've been wondering about that. And there's obviously something built into the business model because the price point is pretty low considering how high profile these artists are. I guess in our world, yeah, you know, you're, but you're able to sort of limit the amount of content. Then you can do a second volume or a third. Exactly, volume you, you do, and and you start to just from the feedback and the reviews, yeah. you can kind of get a feel for what people really liked about the first one, right? And they incorporate more of that into the second one, and then you get to bundle things together, right. and yeah. So with Omar, we've done a couple volumes, and Eric, we've done three, and now these guys are just like my friends, like they're family yeah. to me, and it's um, just exciting to kind of build a business with my musical friends and heroes and mentors and it's a new revenue stream for them it's a win-win it's it's mailbox money every quarter it seems like you play a number of roles and one of them is kind of A&R-ish I mean what's funny to me is if you were making records with this same roster I would say you have one of the most exciting labels of the most interesting players around today yeah well, well thank you I mean that w- that's always been kind of the focus like I wanted to be the blue note of loops so like you pick up a blue note album you know it's going to be good there's quality control there's consistency there's you know it's there's just kind of a thread that goes through it all and, and that's what really what I wanted to do with the loop loft. What I think is interesting and amazing about the whole process is that after 10 years of living in New York, this started to come into focus for you when you left and moved to Boston and mm-hmm. really came alive when you took us one step further away from the epicenter of the scene and moved to Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. So I just decided <laughs> to, uh, well, the business had grown to the point where I was, you know, I was still working that day job um, in, in Boston at a, a innovation consultancy firm called Continuum, an amazing place and probably a major reason why I was inspired to kind of really get creative and push the boundaries because that's kind of what they do. They design products and business strategies and a bunch of like MIT, PhD people sitting yeah. around figuring out cool things. So being around that. So uh, in the same way, like being at a Berkeley pushed you to practice when you were a music student, exactly. pushed you to innovate. It's like you always want to be like the least talented or smartest person in the room if you want to get better. And mm-hmm. that was kind of definitely the case at, at Continuum, like just intimidated, intimidated, but inspired, like brilliant minds, you know, uh, around me. So the loop loft had grown, you know, kind of I was still working, doing the loop loft on my own at night and weekends. And it got to the point where I saw that maybe I could do this full time and, and pay my mortgage and my car payments. And at this point, we had a son and we owned a house. So there came that day where I had to kind of, you know, as a baby bird would jump from the nest, like just go all in and, and quick, you know, give my, my notice at work. And that's and that's really when the business took off. It was like, you know, do or die. And it was it's one of those, you know, kind of scariest 
things I've ever done, but I, you know, it's you got to take those risks to really succeed. So you decided it would be more affordable, easier if you went to Midwest. Yeah, and that was yet yeah, another reason. You know, we wanted to have another child, and and I knew that you know I could afford a house in Des Moines where I could have a you know nicer studio and more room for the family, and just being close to my family. And actually, it put me between LA and New York, right? Literally, like right in the middle. So two right. hour flights either way. So in some ways, it, you feel more connected to what you need to be connected to. On the other hand, do you feel that isolation? And how does it affect you know the way you see yourself in the midst of all of this? It, well, it kind of puts me in the mindset of the consumer because these people aren't in New York and they're not in LA mostly. They're people in Des Moines or is Columbus, that, Ohio. Is that true? You, you can see the stats. You see most of your users are not in New York and L.A. I mean, that's, you know, there's obviously like a large portion of them are, yeah. but majority, no. They're all over the world. I mean, it's yeah. 70% U.S. and the rest is all over the world. And But it's people not in major cities with access to the best musicians in the world. So if I put myself kind of in that same position, I, I kind of feel... I can feel what they feel as far as like, you know, it that person isn't a phone call away or I, I, that person, you know, that drummer can't be in my studio in three hours if I need them. So right. that kind of drives me to kind of keep keep providing the, you know, the good stuff coming for people that live anywhere with an Internet connection. You feel a sense of empathy. You understand exactly. what, they, what they're going through. What surprises you about or what has surprised you? in terms of feedback that you've gotten from your users? Were, were there any things that you didn't expect that they wanted or liked? That's a good question. I mean, it's it's been interesting. Like, you, you see what sells the most. And, like, at first I wouldn't know, like, would guitar loops sell more than drum loops? And, you know, what, one thing that's easier to to start a song as a building block is obviously drums because you're not you're not limited by you know a chord or mm -hmm. harmony yep um so you know that was kind of an interesting thing to learn yeah. and i guess not a total shock looking back at it but it's easier to sell drum loops but then people will discover that like charlie hunter guitar loops which again another hero of mine like growing up like worshipped charlie hunter yeah. like my friends and I like would drive, you know, a hundred miles to go see him if you know he was ever near Des Moines, and yep. so that you find people that are looking for Charlie Hunter loops, and then now they, you know, they, they find it. So it's grown to the point where it is the all star team where you can build a band with, you know, oh, I want Mark Kelly, the bass player from the Roots, and what would that sound like if you know with John, Matt Chamberlain on or drums, John Vidakovich, yeah, yeah, or Johnny Vidakovich yeah. from from New Orleans, or like you know just. It's that mixing and matching with that feel and the DNA of, of these amazing musicians that excites me and apparently excites, fortunately excites, you know, the, the customers. How has it changed your relationship to playing? Just through osmosis of being around these guys, it's it's made me a better, you know, drummer. Just it, literally, it's like a master class each time I have a session with one of these guys. I'm just sitting there like soaking it in, basking in their, you know, their uh, musical genius. And just trying to hope that like a little teeny bit, you know, rubs off, rubs off on me. You know, what's interesting is that you honor the essence of each of these players. You know, like you say, you th really think about, well, what are the Omar Hakim feels that he's most associated with? Why would you hire an Omar Hakim? Mm -hmm. At the same time, like in my world, I tend to use a lot of this stuff in very fast production context, like when I'm doing commercial work. Yep. And I still come back to your initial read of the market where you would do grooves that were like basically like this is an LCD sound system style groove. This is a Vampire Weekend style yeah. groove. And you kind of cleverly disguised all of them so you could kind of figure out what it was based on. Yeah, I think, I think the vibe is crucial and just getting not just the plane but like the, the, sound. the sound. Yeah, like the LCD kind of thing, like kind of right. really crunchy, dry, yeah. you know, semi-distorted but punchy drum sound and... And I find that stuff to be super, I mean, this is just my little user feedback for you. I still use that stuff all the time, even though, you know, I have access to all this great Mark Juliana stuff, for example, yeah. which I would love to use, but I don't have the opportunity often to use that level of subtlety in mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Exactly. And, and there's something just kind of like balls to the wall. This is a, like a, takes you to a genre place. It takes you to an automatic space. Yeah. And that's kind of been my, my focus or my, my responsibility, I guess, uh, is filling those gaps in the loop loft. You know, we, we have the artist, and that's very, well, you know, what you hear is that yeah. person. It's, it's, it's a very clear uh, reflection of, of their playing, which yeah. honestly is, is what I want to do. But then when I record the loops that I sell, um, whether it's like 
wide open drums or from the garage yep. series where I'm banging stuff in my, literally in my garage and just going for certain vibes that and fill, filling in these gaps that, that aren't in the catalog, catalog quite yet. Are you also personally responsible for chopping these things up and making the loops and making the kits and all that stuff? I used to be. I'm, I, I'm still very hands on with that, but I, I now have a uh, I'm very fortunate to have a, an assistant of sorts um, in uh, Iowa. Uh, he's like he's from Iowa, but he's at Berkeley. He's uh-huh. kind of my little my little. I don't want to yeah. talk like that, but he, my my uh, secret. Weapon. I'm his mentor. Yeah, yeah, I guess at this point, like he's he went to my same high school that I, I went to and. Now he's at Berkeley and he's he does all the customer support and he does a lot of the audio editing and um, he's you know kind of definitely invaluable uh, to the loop loft. But fortunately, he's taken that off my plate so I can focus more on the artist side and of course like the business development side and partnering with all the software companies and that's you know that's obviously a huge part of the business. It's ins- it's really insane when I think about it, Ryan. It's like you start out as a drummer, you end up kind of estranged from your musical life. Yeah. It's overwhelming to me, honestly, when I think about the responsibility of developing a product that then has to work across platform, it has to work in Ableton, it has to work in Logic, it has to work in Pro Tools, it has to work on PC, it has to work on Mac, it has to work in all these different workflows. I mean, you started out just recording, and not that long ago, just re- putting up some mics and recording some loops. Yeah, I mean, and had somebody told me like how hard it would have been back, yeah. like when I started, I probably would have. But did you like, even that's... envision that? I mean, did you? Was that a, dr- a hope of yours or a dream? No, of yours? I mean, it literally, like you know, going back to two thousand eight or nine when I started the blog, it was I was recording in Logic, and then you can like to this day you can go back to my blog, and it's a Logic session. I didn't even make wave files. I didn't make bounces. I just gave you the session yeah. and like an MP3 preview. And then I started to get the feedback from people like, oh, it'd be cool if you just mix these down to, Cause I was totally clueless. I had no idea about loops and, you know, it, loops kind of started more out of the electronic kind of EDM world anyway. And fortunately that's where I was able to kind of fill the gap in that sense. Um, that there wasn't a lot of live, you know, breathing, you know, musician loops out there. And do you think that's how most of it's being used? Y- well, it's, it's, there's a lot of EDM guys using my stuff now to kind of put that human, you know, especially a lot of the percussion stuff and the guitar stuff. That's where they find it useful mm-hmm. to give, you know, a harmonic element or just to, you know, breathe some life into the quantized grid. How world. how how else is it being used? I mean, it's a, it's a, it blows my mind when when I see like the customers that that I mean, Butch Vig buys stuff from me and Peter Gabriel's bought stuff from me. And Dave Holland has bought stuff from me, and it's like. It's being used everywhere, and, mm-hmm. and that's only you know some of the names that I yeah. just happen to see when I'm looking through the orders that come through every day. But it's uh, it's uh, so, so obviously it's people recording full on, um, you know, big time productions with budgets that they could afford to hire a drummer. But I guess the convenience, they they can get what they want quicker and 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 just get it done. Yeah. Um, and then again, and then it's people in their bedrooms who had just bought you know, a Mac for the first time and have garage band and playing blues jams, you know, with, you know, the, you know, some of our bass loops or whatever. When I was still living in Wisconsin, Clyde Stubblefield lived in Madison in 2000, 2001. I went into a studio with him for a day and not unlike the way you approached it, I just called grooves at him. Oh, wow. And I just said, play popcorn, play funky drummer, play a shuffle, play this, play that. And then I wrote an album around it. That's in crazy. Which I totally connected with his kick drum and all the bass lines were written to just what he didn't touch him. Yep. Just whatever he played, that's what we the, wrote Well, that's to. the inspiring thing about these these drummers. Like You just hear two measures of a loop and you just feel your mind just goes places and you start hearing, you know. You hear the song. I mean, what, what blew my mind, and as, as you say, you know, you play some grooves, you play some fills, you play some stuff. It it really does tell you what it wants, you yeah. know. the uh, the The groove often has all of this other information inside of it that yeah. if you tune into it, is co- is composition. Yeah, I mean, and that's like the magic. I you know of that's why humans will never be replaced by machines. Like there's, you connect on on a whole nother level when it's somebody who's very talented and has devoted their life and career to, to making music. And you just, you zone in on that stuff. And, and that's when the magic, you know, happens in, in the creative process. 
Ryan Grew's zoning in and making magic. Okay, so obviously I geeked out with Ryan on his Loop Loft content, and he started to give a sense of how he developed the business, but what did he really want to be when he grew up, and what were the amazing and unexpected events that led to his ultimate success with his company? Before we find out, let me remind you that there are plenty of amazing and unexpected conversations to hear at third-story.com. And I promise you, not only the first one is free. Shuffle on over to third-story.com, sign up, get down, put your foot on the rock, patch your foot, and don't stop. Now for Ryan's unexpected journey from Des Moines to Boston to New York to Boston to Des Moines to the moon. What did you initially want for yourself as a musician? I mean, going all the way back, how did you see yourself? I mean, so, you know, I started, I'll kind of give you the, the quick backstory, you know, grow, growing up in Iowa, for, was very fortunate to have a very good music program uh, in high school and was way into like, you know, jazz band and big band and total jazz nerd. Um, but I always was more of a pop fan and knew that like kind of Berkeley was the place to go if you wanted to be kind of a session type drummer and stuff. Not So I really wasn't looking at the, the Manhattan School of Music or the um, the more jazz focused places. Mm -hmm. So, uh, was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to Berkeley and, and, um, that's was still my focus. Actually, I, I became a music production and engineering major for uh -huh. a short while. Um, which, cause I was just drawn to the whole technical, you know, engineering side of things, but I saw that it was taken away from this weird opportunity in your life to do nothing but practice for four years, which you know, you'll never have again. And you, I, I wanted to kind of... It's your job to practice. Exactly. Right? And just being around Berkeley, we're so competitive. And I felt like being an mp &E major where, you know, you're very active in the studio recording other musicians. I just, I was like jealous of the guys I was recording. I was like, I want to be the drummer on the other side of the glass. So quickly switched back to a performance major and uh, um, graduated in two, when was it? 2000. Moved to L.A. to kind of, you know, make it as a big time, you know, session guy and, hmm. and was uh, quickly uh, smacked with reality that it's, you know, it's not as easy as, as one thinks. So you're like a 22 year old. I'd ride out of Berkeley, move to L.A. Yeah. Like, you know, just because you think that's what you, you're supposed to do. You know, m half my friends moved to New York from Berkeley, half of them moved to L.A. And so we were kind of, you know, there was kind of this apartment in L.A. where we all kind of crashed and ended up and. You know, I was I was playing jazz gigs around and like, you know, the I got sucked into a wedding band where I had to buy a tux and, mm -hmm. you know, it was easy money. And but it was just like, you know, just sucking the life out of my, you know, I was I was uninspired and I was just like, uh, and literally ended up like trying to just to make rent, like being like central casting, like being an extra on TV, because that's what all my other friends were doing. Like, mm -hmm. if, if you don't have a gig that day, go, you know, stand and stand around and be like an, you know, on Frasier or something like some guy, like right. literally like in, in, you know, at a basketball game, you're just sitting there eating popcorn and, and that, that's your job. And so that was kind of a low point. Um, actually, no, the low point was there was a show called Son, Son of the Beach. It was produced by Howard Stern. It was like a Bay, Baywatch okay. spoof. And my job was to dress up as uh, uh, a cock, a chicken. And it was the Cox versus the Beavers in this basketball game, and I'm Whoa. like sitting there, calling my mom, or my mom's talking me on the phone. I'm, she's like, "What are you doing today?" I'm, I'm dressed up in this costume. Like, I'm like, I think it's probably time to get out of L.A. and yeah. and let's do this uh, New York thing. So, so did, how long did you last? All in I LA? lasted nine months. So you know, it, it, I gave it the old uh, yeah you know, post college try, post college try, and then kind of drove back across country again, made, made a little pit stop in uh, Des Moines uh, just to kind of figure out the next move. And then th there was this apartment in Queens in Astoria where all my friends were. It was Bob Reynolds and mm -hmm. Patrick Cornelius and Asen Doikin and Adam Schmeens. And it was kind of this total Berkeley um, house for you know people just getting out of school. So ended up getting a, sleeping on a couch there for a while. And Again, needed money, um, but I was in New York, and I, I discovered this temp agency that that booked kind of people at Atlantic Records. Like, I was like, well, if I'm gonna work a day job, you know, I might as well learn the music business. And Atlantic was one of my favorite, you know, legendary labels. And 
I was kind of bouncing around. I got, I got in and was bouncing around from department to department, like, you know, marketing and wherever they needed me to, to kind of sit and answer the phones. And um, the HR person kind of took a liking to me. And she was like, you know, the the CEO, Ahmed Erdogan, need, needs an assistant. Are you interested? And this is like a week or two into me landing in, in New York. So, uh, yeah, I was like, of course. So, like, that was... Two so weeks you were in Ahmed Erdogan's assistant? Yeah. Well, talk about a, an improvement over dressing yeah, up like a Yeah, it's better than, yeah, dressing up like a cock. I was now, you know, Ahmed's uh, assistant and, like, answering the phone and Aretha Franklin would be calling or Jimmy Page or, like, just mind-blowing stuff. What do you remember about him? What did you learn from him? The way he treated people, you know, just with so much respect. And that's kind of how he built Atlantic was... You know, he, he was a, a jazz fan and, and R&B fan, and he was, you know, he wanted to be in the studio with, you know, he co-wrote a, a lot of those Ray Charles songs. Yes. And um, just seeing how involved he was, he wasn't really a musician, but how hands-on he was. And, and just, you know, people that weren't even on the label anymore 30 years later were he's just near and dear friends that were calling. And I saw, like, how he respected people and um, and just having, like, a really high quality for... Because I, I, I would literally sit with him and listen to demo recordings that were coming in, you know, managers trying to get acts signed and taking notes because he didn't, you know, do, he didn't do email or whatever. But And how did he listen? Just sit back in his chair and, you know, he'd close his eyes and, you know, there were only a few that really, you know, kind of perked his ears and like went on to kind of, you know, get demo deals or, or get signed. But yeah, he just, he, he was always searching for a certain vibe that kind of, you know, the, the goosebump factor and, and just being around him, like, again, so fortunate. I don't know the osmosis thing, but that's kind of where I, the taste maker aspect was really important. Well, that's what I'm thinking, you know, I mean, when you built, started to build the loop loft, you did have to sort of make a, a take a, a leap where you realized I'm not just providing content and I'm not just going to play all this stuff myself, but I want to curate. I want to be a tastemaker. I, I want to take my taste and turn other people onto it. And th that's very much a and I Yeah. Think. I mean, because like loops, beats aren't a commodity. Like, you know, no beat is the same. Like, you know, and that's, I, I think that's how the, in the loop industry had been treated, you know, previously. Like it was just, you know, any producer with you know, a quantized MIDI groove and, you know, that that's kind of how things were being sold. So having the chance and the connections, you know, from, from my time in New York, that's, you know, I really seized the opportunity there. See, what I think part of the message is that you're kind of offering is I want to elevate the way we talk about this and I want to elevate the way we think about the way we use loops. I have no idea what your most popular loops are. I, I suspect that they're not the ones that press my my buttons artistically all the time. Mm -hmm. But I still think it's a. I could be wrong about that, but I still think it's like incredibly valuable, just to the way we think about music production, as you say, to elevate the people that are doing it. Yeah. Meanwhile, there have been some other little projects that have emerged. Like, like, have you checked out the Rubber Tracks library at all? Uh, a little, I'm vaguely familiar with it. I know it's kind of this. Uh, what's the shoe company? Uh, Converse. Converse, yeah. and there's it's here in Brooklyn, right? Like, yeah, uh, I haven't been to the studio. It's kind of interesting. It's like it's kind of the similar philosophy, but with an a, a element of anarchy built into it. Also, where I think that they just assemble groups of people, they go in, record. And and then it it's delivered to this library. Yeah, that, and that's kind of something we've we've actually done and experimented, and we're gonna do again in right. the future. Like I've I've gone down to Presonus's headquarters down in uh, Baton Rouge, yeah. and I was fortunate enough to convince Charlie Hunter to fly down, and I was like, you know, let's let's just you, you pick whatever drummers you want, you know, we'll we'll see if they're into it. Um, we'll go into the studio for two days, and you guys will just jam, and we'll release that, and. So that's kind of, I guess, I, I had no idea that, yeah, yeah, like, I guess, same concept, but... Well, like, and that's Charlie Hunter and Eric Harlan sort of had that going, too, right? Yeah, and we they, did that at the bunker yeah. as well. So that, actually, that was the first time yeah. that I had assembled um, two session. of my artists together and just kind of, who had never even met before. Like, they yeah. were obviously familiar with, with each other. And in, in my mind, I was like, well, what if these two got together? And, you know, it's all isolated, so you can still just use the drums yeah. or you can still just use Charlie's stuff later on. But really... You get two of these guys at this level gelling and grooving yeah. and in the pocket. And that's, you know, that's, and just, just to me as a fan, just sitting there in the control room for, you know, 
the afternoon while we record. Yeah. It's you know pretty remarkable. So so I want to get the rest of the story. So so you're at Atlantic Records. You're Amit Erdogan's personal assistant. Or yeah. assistant. Yeah, I was. I, yeah. He actually had two. Like there was kind of his more personal yeah. one, and I was kind of like the guy at the desk, you know, like. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, literally, yeah, I was with him on like nine eleven. I remember that day. Wow. Like he was, he was at home because he never came into the office till like eleven. He'd kind of, you know, you know, he's the boss. Um, but he would always call me like right at nine a.m. to check in, you know, get messages and and whatever. Um, and were you playing drums at the same time? I so yeah, so I was kind of living this kind of dual life I was, I was doing the music day job during the day at atlantic and then i was also playing in this you know kind of indie rock band uh this guy louis Schifano, who was in he was in remy zero and really great artist still uh love his work to this day um we were playing you know around town doing the whole pianos you know uh cbgb's you know mm-hmm. the whole kind of the vibe and I also was doing a lot of kind of just random s- s- session work sort of my, my friend claudius mittendorfer um, who's an amazing engineer, was working at the Hit Factory. He was on staff, and he would call me like when when they you know they had open slots, just free time, and he just wanted to kind of work on his mixing and mm-hmm. just practicing recording, you know, drums and just ele- elevating his game. So I was you know fortunate enough to like you know get off work at Atlantic and then cruise on over to the Hit Factory and record drums at night, and it's kind of this dual world of playing gigs at night and, and, and doing the day job, like that continued for um, a few years. And that's when I met uh, Will Bates of, of The Rinse, who that's, and that's, I believe, around the time you and I met. Yeah, I guess, I guess it is. I guess he and I met in um, 2005. Yeah. So. I can't remember who introduced us. It was like a friend of a friend that met at some party and they're like, yeah, there's this guy from... Uh, from London, and he's he's got this crazy Brit pop kind of thing going on, and he you know he's looking for a good drummer and so and so. So you know we 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 he got my number and and we got together in his rehearsal space in Williamsburg, and that was the beginning of the rinse. And uh, and was Gabe Kahane playing in the band? And at that Gabe point? Kahane was in the band. Yeah, is is crazy to think. Um, we had this little rehearsal space in Williamsburg, and. Uh, Long Wave, another band was in the room across from us, and uh, uh, oh, I can't think of their names now. Another band that got signed, and um, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, a lot of act activity going on in in, in this uh, in in this rehearsal space, and so I was working for Ahmet, and then actually I kind of moved over to the art department because uh, unfortunately Ahmet got sick, and um, he's you know s- s- kind of stopped coming into work, and so they moved me over to the creative department. A great job in like the art. So that's where I learned Photoshop and kind of product management and more chops around that side of the of the business um and was there for a couple of years i guess while this is when when i met wills and then i got laid off they, uh-huh. they they merged atlantic and electra and there were mass you know it's, the industry was crumbling there were massive layoffs at warner's so you know I, I, it was pretty devastating like they literally like two floors of the office were just shut down and people were given their you know, severance and but fortunately this is when I was playing with the rinse and it was almost like a miracle. It was like, wow, I've got severance pay and I've got, you know, unemployment money coming in. I was like actually making more money than I'd ever made in my life. Being out of work. Being out of work. I was like I, I declared it the, the summer of Ryan. Right. You know, like you're just like living it up and, and in this band. And it was also at that at that point when Peter Asher um found out about the band. Peter's a for those that don't know, is kind of a legendary manager and producer um he ran apple records for the beatles and then went on to uh manage and produce all the james taylor stuff and the whole kind of california pop scene in the you know late 60s early mm-hmm. 70s anyway he his daughter was a, was kind of a friend and a fan of the band and she brought him down to the rehearsal studio and uh he had us play some tunes and next thing we knew we had a management contract with peter asher and we were and this is why I was in that summer of Ryan where I was just getting, you know, checks coming in the mail and knew I had to probably get a job at some point. But, you know, this is a crazy opportunity. So we flew out to to L.A. and, and stayed at Peter's house in Malibu and recorded at Conway Studios mm-hmm. and like did the whole thing. And that's where we really, you know, thought, you know, ooh, we're going to get signed. This is, you know, and, and he obviously thought that, too. And but again, uphill battle in the in- industry really rough shape and i mean it still is but 2005 2006 um i had heard stories i don't know if this is before you joined 
forces with Will or not, but it sounds like it might have been during this period that, that Maroon 5 was kind of hanging around in that Ye- crew as well. Yeah, so they were like kind of like our f- friends randomly, just um, Will's has known those guys for a long time um, and some other guys in, in the rinse were also friends. So they were, you know, any time they came to New York, we were always, you know, just bar hopping and going out and, and getting into trouble. And So it probably smelled like it was really close. It, it We went to Europe and played shows with them. So we, you know, we're opening for Maroon 5 at the Hammersmith Apollo yeah. and like still unsigned and Peter's bringing out heads of labels to come and it, it felt so close. And then it just kind of, never happened it's just one of those things um which i'm kind of thankful that it didn't happen because i wouldn't have ended up where i am now probably so after that sort of fell apart you stayed in new york for a couple more years before you left well maybe for another year or two that's you know obviously the uh summer ryan ended (laughs) and uh i needed to start paying rent again so i I took a job at nickelodeon and that's where i kind of got into the geeky digital asset management stuff so nickelodeon and then revlon and then Got married and we moved to Boston, and hence the the, the Ryan Groose blog started, and then the the Loop Loft started. Ryan Groose got married, bought a house, settled down, and blew up the world of drum production content from his basement. But it's clear that he's not only a drum fanatic and a good A and R guy, but also somebody who loves the tedious parts, the data analysis, the marketing strategies, the number crunching. I'm pretty sure that's what they call that. Here he tells me a bit about what's involved in attracting and keeping customers, and ultimately he reveals that he knows more about my buying habits than I know about myself. Folks, I don't need to know anything about your buying habits to loop you in to the Third Story website. It's third-story.com for all your Third Story podcast needs. And now, the final segment of my conversation with Ryan Groose. So what do you think the success of the Loop Loft and this kind of hunger for content along these lines says about the music business today and the future of the music, like what people are looking for and, and, and the way music operates in our lives? I mean, I think it's, it's, exci- it's, it's the most exciting time in music right now. Everybody is in total control of their own destiny. Like before you needed, obviously, distribution, a label, you, you had to be one of the chosen ones to to yeah. to make it and that's not i mean the, the major labels still have their place today as far as the marketing muscle and um but you see all these acts that you know are succeeding or, or getting to that point at least on their own now by self-producing at home and, and releasing eps and doing kind of not needing the budgets of a label just working on a laptop and using some loops or, or whatever a midi controller keyboard and you can produce a pretty high polished you know quality sounding yeah. album these days the one thing that i think i lament in all of this is that it's a lot of isolation i mean you you you, you might have this sort of mastermind producer who gets a chance to put doug womble and uh, matt chamberlain on a track together because it's a fantasy that they get to play out but they're still happening in these really siloed ways and and i think as somebody who came up playing music in mm-hmm. a band or in you know, collaborative setting. And now you're living in Iowa, which is probably a very isolated thing. Yeah. The, the one thing that's sort of missing from this whole formula is just being together. Yeah. No, I mean, that you'll never, obviously that's the most ideal way to make music. Um, but then you get, you look at it the other way is what else would you have the opportunity to make music with some of these musicians? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question because I, I think that musicians, particularly the great ones, uh, the ones who work a lot are called, as much for who they are as what they play. Exactly. And, you know, you're fortunate enough to actually be in the room with a lot of these people and to see who they are and how they are, not just mm-hmm. how they play, but how they are. Yeah. You know, maybe you can capture some of that spirit as the stuff is going down, but how much of a role do you think people's personalities actually plays in their success in the studio? Well, that, I mean, that's one thing I've, I've, I've learned is none of these guys are assholes. Like you won't make it in this business if you're a jerk. Like they're the sweetest, you know, they're, they're my friends. Like I text them and yep. share very, you know, like personal things and we you know, celebrate birthdays and it's go out to dinner when, you know, if I'm in town and yep. it's, I, I treat it like that. And that's just how they are in general. Like they're, they're the nicest, you know, greatest people in the world. Yeah. In terms of your A&R choices, how much of it is governed by what you like and how much of it is governed by what you recognize as being, desired some something that you see there's a market for it 
it's still pretty much what I like. You know, I mean, obviously there's the whole EDM world, which is much larger than the world that I'm living in right now. But yeah. I, you couldn't pay me to sit down and yeah, like Tiesto or any of these Diplo, whatever. You know, yeah. that whole world, like it's just so quantized, and it's not my, you know, fine for them. Uh, but it's just it doesn't excite me. Um, I want to work with people that inspire me, and and thus will inspire the people that use the loops. Um, so it's right now I'm, you know, exciting projects kind of in the pipeline right now with some, you know, other musicians that, that just blow my mind, you know, I'll see them like Nate yeah. Smith, we were just talking yeah. about, he's been doing some really cool stuff on Facebook, like just yeah. these videos and one year. So we'll be going into the studio with him soon. And David Cook, great piano yeah. player, Taylor Swift's band leader. Yeah. He's he's getting ready to work on some stuff and still kind of rounding out that that artist the 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 roster, but still being very selective and I mean not in a snobby way. I can only put out like so many things and but just just I, I, and I'm honored to to have the the chance to do it with these guys. But it's you know does it make sense? Would you feel comfortable saying what's your bucket list? I mean, are there people that you want to approach, or is it not? Is it not working that way? No, I mean, all right, I'll, I'll put it out there. Ringo is the guy. Like he's, I'm and I'm working it. Like Peter Asher's friends mm-hmm. with him, and I, you know, I'm gonna. It took me two years to get Matt Chamberlain to record for me. Like, that's, how did you approach him, and what was that process like? So you know, it was early on in the loop loft. Like I just launched, and, and there, you know, wasn't a lot of traction. I was still working the the job, and I emailed him directly on his website, and he was very sweet. He wrote me back. He's like, you know, thanks. Thanks, but I just you know don't really have the time, and you know, he obviously he's very busy and and just is he still bu- re- very busy? Yeah, he has his own studio. Um, so uh, it's actually in the famous uh, Sound City complex, yeah. um, which is pretty exciting exciting to go there uh, and record him. But yeah, he's he he has his you know his own setup, and you know whether it's major label stuff or just you know independent projects he's every day he's you know he's very and he still tours a lot too he, go, he goes out on the road mm-hmm. but yeah so matt matt was kind of my, my bucket list guy from the beginning and you know just what were the matt records that really turned you on when you were in college oh man i mean the first wallflowers album uh you know that one headlight group yeah. with that ringy stare drum and you know like that's that it's yeah. just so tasty um all the uh, Macy Gray album he did, the Fiona Apple stuff he was doing. It was like all my favorite albums had you Matt at, yeah. playing drum. You know, it was like, you know, he he was he still is like, you know, the man. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of every year I would follow up with Matt and he'd kindly, you know, say he was busy, but let's keep, you know, be in touch. And he, it kind of, you know, the, the maybe it was three years later, he emailed me. He's like, all right, when are we doing this? Did he see something that you'd put out, or how did he find out? I about guess it? maybe he'd just kind of seen that I had really been growing this thing, and you know, there there had been a lot of other musicians that have, you know, I think I, think I already had Char- Charlie at that point. That probably helped because those two are pretty close musically. How much of a role has social media and marketing played in the growth of this thing? Oh, I mean, massive. Probably anybody listening to this has seen a Loop Loft ad on Facebook, and you know, it's. Well, that's what I wonder. I mean, I see them everywhere, and I just feel like I'm being totally tailed by the loop loft. And I assume it's because I'm a customer. I fit, you know, the profile. As you know, it seems like I interview somebody, and then I get an ad for a loop loft thing. And it's like, you know, we're 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 looking at the same kinds of people and interested mm-hmm. in the same kinds of people. So I, I've just sort of assumed that I must be just ticking all the boxes for the for the consumer. Yeah, I mean. Unfortunately, I think Facebook ads, that was a key driver of, of our growth from the, the beginning because, you know, in the first time in history, you had access to, you knew what people were into, you know, and you didn't have that with any other advertising platforms. And and you could scale, you could spend $10 a day on ads if you wanted, or you can spend $10,000 yeah. a day if you want. So I could start small and, and that was kind of how I grew the email list and just really was, was targeted at people that basically just use certain software and, you know, we're into certain things and lived in certain cities and demographics. And I totally, and I still to this day, like fully geek out on that stuff. Like you, I, it seems like you followed all of the f- stuff that you should do. Like, I don't do any of the stuff now that I think of it. Like, I think I joined your list because 
I got some a free thing yeah. if I did, you know, and yeah. and I think I liked you because it was just like there was so much content coming at me that I finally just said, okay, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm on board. You yeah, know? we're pretty relentless, like you know, and, and we'll give you tons of free stuff and like just go to the loop loft right now, and a little box will pop up, and you'll get a free demo with these multi track. Um, yeah. We just updated it, so it's got some of the Omar stuff, some of the Matt Chamberlain stuff, yeah. um, and you can have 15 channels of audio for free and try it out and just, I mean. Uh, I'm not trying to be all salesy, yeah. but it's that's how you get people hooked. It's the drug dealer method. You know, you give them a taste and they can't go back. So you said you geek out on everything from the demographic, the location, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah. What have you learned about that? And what sort of, if somebody were going to approach you and say, I want to do this too, how would you advise them to approach it? I mean, it's it's been, you know, I'm almost 10 years into this now, six with the loop loft, but... Yeah, you have to under if you want to succeed kind of in this world of music software and loops and stuff, you need to be very good at marketing. Like you can have the best product in the world, but if you don't know how to market it, pe- people won't know about it, people won't buy it. Um you got to know about email lists and drip campaigns and you know respecting your customers and and taking care Wait, of What's your a drip campaign? Oh man, I can I'm going down a rabbit hole here. So, a drip campaign, this is uh, email marketing 101 nerd talk is when you sign up for the free sample pack and then a couple of days later you'll get something else and it's kind of you kind of go through this funnel of of you know offers and stuff um, or just promote and not even offers just like you know informational like you know I'll send you to a blog post I did about mixing drums a certain way or what mics or you know just other kind of geeky musician stuff that people like to, you know, obviously we don't want to be sell, sell, sell all the time. It's, it's got to be kind of more interactive. With but it does remind me of like the classic sales approach, which is just get people saying yes, get them saying yes. Yeah. To just like, yes, I want to watch that. Yes, I'm interested in that. Yes, I will. Con- I will continue to be a part of this process. Yeah. And then that's the, you know, I, I think it's backed up by kind of I, I can see the number like the repeat customers and stuff like it's 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 once somebody becomes a customer they're they're with us and and they're buying from us you know constantly so it's and you see that once somebody's in they're in yeah like i i know the lifetime value of what a customer and that's how i've been able to kind of scale the marketing because i know Uh that we're really getting into some really geeky marketing stuff but like so it's there's basically two numbers you need to know it's it's the um cost per acquisition and the lifetime value. So if, once you kind of have those two numbers figured out. You so, can... ba- so for example, based on my behavior as a customer, you have a sense of what, of how I much know, I will spend? I know what you will spend over the course of three years. And I know what I should be willing to spend to make you a customer. Right. Incredible. That's just Mark. That's any business. Like those, those are the two key drivers of, of growth in, 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 the, in any, if you read, you know, it's kind of MBA 101. It's see what's interesting to me about it, though is that you, I don't hear you saying that you adjusted the product too radically according to the market. What I hear you saying is you adjusted the marketing. Yep. According to the market, that's the right lever to push. Like I, I, I don't want to sacrifice the product. It's still all about the quality, but it's 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 getting people in the door as if we were putting on a concert. Like how do we get? How do we put? butts in the seats you know like that's i'm trying to put butts in the seat i'm trying to right. get people in and uh that's kind of you know kind of unfortunately kind of one of my weird skill sets that i'm I'm good with i mean you looking at it and kind of hearing the overall arch of your career and your life you were the exact right person for this yeah it's kind of like, like looking back through all the stuff i went through it was kind of training to make the loop laugh like destiny i don't know what you want to call it but it it's it's looking back everything kind of makes sense now like going to berkeley and working at atlantic and being in the rinse and you know going through all that stuff did it feel when you started doing it like this is right it did it feel like it was a the right fit for you yeah i mean kind of like that day that i, I quit my day job and was responsible for you know paying the mortgage and feeding my family and but I was doing it, you know, it, it was, it was like, wow, there's, I kind of invented my dream job and it's supporting my family. Like I get to sit here and make drum beats yeah. and just geek out and like put them online and people will buy them. Like how crazy is that? 
Man, I think it's a really interesting story. I mean, you and I have been in touch over the last few years because you know I'm a user and I just like the product. And part of it is like, I just love hearing those kits. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's yeah. just something like amazing about hearing the way the guys tune their drums and the yeah. way they choose their cymbals. And it's like, you, you know, you hear those things on records, but then hearing them broken out into their little constituent parts is kind of interesting and i i mean i use the stuff just i just make kits and play grooves out of them yeah like that. i mean so yeah we we try to sample everything and that's something we didn't do early on yeah. i guess and i should have answered that in one of your other questions right. about kind of user feedback but i was just doing loops but i wasn't yeah. sampling my drums so like kind of you know a year into it as i was doing a session then i would kind of do the the sample part where you you know right. and i don't go crazy with like multi samples like hitting a, a yeah. snare drum like a hundred times a different you know like i just give you the one shots that you need and you know what's funny is i probably am using more on a daily basis i have now that i think of it i have a trigger template set up uh -huh. and i think i have eric mark matt and i just scroll through them no they're just in line and i mute oh. them and find and, the one and that... find the one and tune it and it's inside my snare sound That's all awesome. the time yeah and and it's like those little things where I, I'm not, I don't even think about how that's affected my workflow, but even in do it, recording live drums, I'll just have that available to just kind of punch up my sound mm -hmm. with my favorite drummers. Exactly. That, and it's such a subtle thing. But anyway, you know, I, I was interested in talking to you about how you put the, the whole package together, but I realize your personal story is actually crucial to the way the whole thing unfolded. Ryan Gruss, thank you so much for taking time to tell me about it today. Thank you so much for having me. There he was, Ryan Groose, making loops and changing the world one backbeat at a time. If you liked it, then you will certainly enjoy my previous conversations with Charlie Hunter and Doug Womble, both loop loft artists, as well as Benji Rogers, founder of Pledge Music, and Peter Keckley, co-founder of Upworthy, two excellent technology entrepreneurs in their own rights. I'll be back next week with another great conversation. Until then, I'll talk to you soon.